You're watching an extended viewpoint tonight with Fabian Picardo and Daniel Featham. We'll go to your calls and emails shortly as promised, but first let's go through the other important issues highlighted by the 650 people we asked in our poll. After the power station, our poll suggests the second most important issue to voters at the next election could be employment. For almost a fifth of respondents, 19%, employment was the most important issue. Mr. Featham, the Chief Minister has claimed that unemployment is very significantly down as compared to late 2011, but clearly Gibraltarians are still a little concerned about employment. Well, look, unemployment has been, going back to uh, the early 1990s indeed, in fact, uh, in the early 1990s there was a spike in unemployment, really mainly due to the fact that we were transitioning from an MOD-based economy to a private sector economy. But ever since, uh, unemployment has oscillated between 300 and 500. That is precisely what the unemployment was in the final year of the GSD government. In fact, you can uh, just simply <coughs> look at the, um, the uh, uh, GSLP manifesto, Joe Bosano, and it actually said here that unemployment as of June of 2011 was 421. Now, what they are effectively saying, which is another lie that the government is perpetuating, is that when we left office, that there were 1,000 unemployed or 1,200 unemployed. And the reason why they say that is because I managed to calculate exactly what the cost of the future job strategy would be. And the reason why I was able to do that was because the future job strategy was not only applicable to the unemployed, in other words, those 421 people, but also those on the on the VTS scheme and other, uh, and other uh, training schemes. And what I did was I basically uh, multiplied that by the minimum wage to nail the, the figure. Now, hang on a minute, now hang on a minute. But you what he says, the question. Well, what, he's, what, what they're saying effectively is that all those people were unemployed. Look, it's ridiculous to say that people on training schemes, on VTS, and at the last election there were 450, were unemployed. As a matter of common sense, they're not unemployed. As a matter of internationally accepted definition of what is unemployed, people on, uh, on training schemes, state-run training schemes, are not unemployed. And indeed, the final nail in the coffin, as far as this argument yes, is concerned... No, no, but the, the, well, the but final you're nail... you're defending your record, but you haven't answered the no, question. No, because... Is it a concern for people? That, that, I mean, that's no, no, question. but you have said that they have reduced unemployment. That's what you have said I've to me. I've put it to you. Yes, but and I'm saying and I'm saying no, that actually unemployment is within the ranges that it's always been. Okay. And no, no, hang on a minute, because the VTS scheme, the VTS scheme, they introduced the VTS scheme in the early 1990s. Now, they never treated people on the VTS scheme as unemployed, but they say, but hang on a minute, but when you were elected to government, you should have treated those people as unemployed. It's ridiculous. Okay. Mr. Picardo? Well, look, whether it's 1,200 people or whether it's 421 people, the unemployment figure I was able to disclose in my party political broadcast earlier this week is 269. That is the figure today. The quarterly figure was about 350 but, but for which the last was quarter. It, I mean, is, is the employment the, down no, a couple of hundred or a thousand? Remember, I mean, the quarterly figure is the average. You get an average figure. But I was able to give the actual figure on the day that I gave my broadcast, and that was 269. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a problem, Jonathan, because I, Dan used to say that 300 is full employment. Well, look, 300 may be full employment, and I expect we will be at 300 for the quarterly average at the end of the year. But your your poll was very interesting. It didn't talk about concerns about unemployment. It talked about concerns about employment. And I think that tells us two things. First of all, whilst there is one person unemployed, that is a huge problem for that person. And their family. And their family. And of course, in Gibraltar, we all know each other and we are very closely related. So therefore, that explains that there should be concern about employment. But the fact that the word employment was used rather than unemployment also tells you something else, which is that people also want to improve themselves. They want to change the employment in which they are in, and they want to get into better employment. And politically, we have to be able to assist them to do that also. So there are two sides to this. 269 is a very low figure. I hope it's going to get lower, but we are never going to get to the stage where we have zero unemployed. Let's yeah, let's, that's tackle, an let's issue. tackle that number. And, and the second that's would an be issue. And the how second to is interpret How do we then employment. get Gibraltarians who are in employment up the ladder so that they have better employment? A and that's a second a stage. A positive reading, if you would, of, of our poll question. That's, well, that's positive in the sense that it may mean that people who are in employment and have no concerns about unemployment wish to better their employment, and this is a concern for them, and they want to see the offer that the political parties make to them of how they'll be able to improve themselves, and that's something that I think we can really uh, be held to task on at the general okay. election. 
election. But what are we doing with that? And that's Mr. what people need to be asking their politicians. Mr. Feetum has, um, we've, we've got a caller on the line, and if you wait just one moment, Francis, we'll come to you. Mr. Feedham, you have suggested that Mr. Picardo is lying about that statistic. And uh, before we move on to getting your answer, can no, I just... No, 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 let me tell you what Mr. Picardo is lying about. Yes, what about Mr. Picardo is lying about, about is saying that unemployment was 1,200, one, 1, that was the figure that he gave in his broadcast, at the last election, and it's been yes, reduced to saying. 275. Yes. That is patently not true okay, because so it includes all those people on training schemes. So, Mr. Picardo, your response to that? Very simple. When we announced the future job strategy, we said this would apply and this would be... The the amount that they would be paid would be the minimum wage. And Daniel came out, then he, I think at that stage he was uh, the, the chairman of the GSD and therefore running its campaign saying, this is going to cost £12 million a year at £10,000 per I individual. To the, to he the didn't last explain, pound. he didn't explain, well, it wasn't difficult, Daniel, I mean, multiplying by 10 is the easiest yes, timetable there is. Absolutely. Right? Right, right. Uh, and therefore, you know, they got to the stage where they told us what this program for the unemployed that we were putting together was going to cost. Yes, now, they had people on the YTS, on the youth training scheme who were age 65, that's not a youth training scheme, and who were earning a third of the minimum wage, pocket money. Now, look, they might now try and pretend that that's not unemployment, but a lot of the people in the 1,200 figure felt as if they were unemployed. You well, stand by, must, and they were not youths. Well, so I must you, come back you stand then. by the figure then? Oh, absolutely, I stand I by the figure. I must come back to that. Yeah, because but we've see, got a call away, look, so please make it look, as concise he, as possible. Even in, even in what he has just said, he has misrepresented the position. What he has said is, and Danny knew what the figure was going to be because he knew that unemployment was 1,200 and that this scheme applied to the unemployment Employ. No, this scheme in their manifesto did not only apply to the unemployed, to those 421 people quoted in their manifesto as being unemployed. It also applied to those people, the 450 on the VT VTS training scheme, on the 200 people on sheltered employment and other types of structured training. So that's precisely why. Look, it's not true that there were 1,200. And again, it's a question of credibility. I mean, can you trust a government that is lying about something like this, that is telling you that there were 1,200 people unemployed in 2011? Well, patently, okay. they were not. I, well, I'd, I'd like to return... That we've Reduce it by 200 from 421. Well, no, uh, let me let me let me no. tackle <laughs> let me tackle that. Not no, no, it's no. within it's within no, the Mr. average Fieton that it has been for the last Mr. 16 Picardo, years. Mr. Fieton, Fieton, that's precisely the point I made at the, the public, it's Ridiculous. As the <laughs> the public broadcaster, let's go to the public. Francis, thank you for your patience. Hopefully, if you're still there and you can give us your viewpoint or question, please. Francis, hello. Your viewpoint or question, please. Yep. Yeah. Hello, I would like to ask two questions to both ministers uh, so they can answer. Uh, my first question is, what is the government going to do about teaching our youngsters about working in the construction industry, which I own a company for? I've tried to employ kids for a couple of years now, and they're not trained properly, and we cannot send them anywhere to work. So what's the, any government or whichever government goes into power the next time want to do, want to do okay. about training? Okay, and you said you had two, so go and on. My second question is, what are we going to do about all the Spanish companies that are coming into Gibraltar, taking over the work, not only of the workers, but of the companies, Gibraltarian companies, because they don't pay taxes here, they don't pay insurances, and some of them are not even registered. A very good question. Thank you, Francis, Thank for you calling into Viewpoint. Mr. Picardo will offer you an answer there Look, first. Look, as, as the incumbent, it's my pleasure to go first. First of all, we are doing things to train uh, people to be able to come into the construction industry. We've got a very successful program now, training them to NVQ levels one and two, and we're now introducing the opportunity to continue to train to NVQ level three in those trades which are relevant. We don't want to teach people to be bricklayers. We want to teach people to have skills so that when we don't have a construction boom, when we have the need to maintain the building stock, and this is cyclical and you know that there are booms and then there are maintenance periods, the Gibraltarians who are trained are going to have the skills necessary for that period too. And on the issue that Francis uh, talks about, which is you know, people coming through the frontier and providing services in Gibraltar, this is an issue which is a, a huge bugbear. Look, I think it's a bugbear for all Gibraltarians. But what have you done about power, it? And I'll tell you what we're going to do, try and do about it. What we're trying to do is with the new identity cards that we are producing, we'll also be producing identity cards not just for residents but those who work in Gibraltar and make it easier for those who are properly registered to come in and very difficult indeed for those who are not registered to come into Gibraltar and to ply their trade because of course they come through the frontier okay. and we I'll see give you a coming. chance to come back but first another a follow-up question to that sometimes it's very blatant though it I is. Mean, you, you'll know that, I mean there's, there's one 
cheap kitchen in, installation oh. company, which I can think of from Alinea, whose van you see every day. Absolutely. And, and in the thousand odd days that I've been in power, I haven't been able to do anything about it yet. Well, why not? But because it requires systems that talk to each other. And the minute that we have our systems talking to each other, it will be much easier to control where they are going, who they are going to contract with. And actually, you know what you need to do with these things? You need to make it easy for people to use services and pay their taxes. So in other words, if you're going to contract to buy a kitchen from the linear, you'll be able to electronically tell us what you're doing. You'll be able to tell us what the price is. You'll be able to deduct the withholding tax that you need to deduct. And the person who's providing the kitchen for you will be able to say, yes, that's me. Yes, that's the amount I'm charging. That's the amount what my profit will be. And I accept that this is the amount that you withhold. You need to make people uh, empowered to be able to do things in, which, in a way which is legal. If the system you have in place is so difficult that people cannot actually be honest about it without going through a bureaucracy that is impossible, then you know, people are tempted to do things dishonestly. But do you accept that your government has done nothing to deter that sort of company from coming in okay. and you know, no, no, claiming I, work without paying any taxes. I accept that in the three years we have been in office, we haven't yet done anything about that, unless it's dealing with the government and the public sector. In the public sector, we now have a very robust system so that companies cannot come into Gibraltar, provide services as subcontractors to the government, and get away without paying their dues. When you're dealing with the government, we have already put something in place. Okay. The next stage is to impl implement this for people who are coming in to deal with third parties. Mr. Bigardo, the claims in response to Francis's a question there that his government is creating skills which will be sustainable and which will ensure that people are in employment for a not long true. time. It's not true. Another lie. Look, it's not true. Well, actually, this is probably not a lie on your part. It's just really you don't have a handle in this particular area of employment ah, right, right. because Joe Bosana is the person that's dealing with it and really... So I'm either uh, lying no, to you or I don't, don't know what I'm talking well, about. Well, on this particular issue, you don't know oh, what okay. you're talking about. I see. Look, the, the first GSLP government basically closed the two training and construction centres that were here in Gibraltar. That was a decision taken by Joe Bosana. He's not a great fan of that. And in fact, I have been asking him questions, so has my deputy, Mr. Bosino, about... Um, the, how many people are, are being taken on in the training and construction centres. And actually, they've had no new inputs in the three years that they have been in government. That is the extent of the training that they are providing people. That is why it is not accurate what he said in his own intervention. <laughs> but look, we have, I mean, and the elephant in the room here in these discussions is the future job strategy, for goodness sake. I mean, the future job strategy is a huge letdown, Fabian, by your government... It is condemning a whole generation of young people to no or no adequate training during the four years that you have been in government. And all because three. Mr. Bosana, or three years, and the four years which you are uh, next year, and all because, quite frankly, Mr. Bosana is not interested in proper training. What he's interested in is in basically statistics. It's in getting people into a job. Doesn't matter how dead end that particular job may be. You cannot offer proper training to people in the two or three months that they are on this particular scheme. And it's a massive letdown because in your manifesto, well, what you promised was a dedicated training scheme okay. of a maximum of three of three okay. years. You've made it's your point. It's nothing of the sort. You've made your point be very briefly back. because we've got some emails to get through. I, I assume it's not as much of a letdown as the YTS, the youth training scheme, was to the person who was 65, who we found employed in it when we were elected. Look, the fact is that whether it's 1,200 or 421, there are today 269 people unemployed. And a lot of people have gone through the system in that time. And a lot of people have got the skills. And you know what the elephant in the room is? It's not that I'm lying and it's not that I don't know what I'm talking about, which is the only way that Danny seems to be able to deal with anything that goes against the logic that he's trying to twist and turn. It's that people are in employment and that people have been through the future job strategy and they know how good it is for them because they spend many years unemployed, they spend many years without training and they are now in a job. And the elephant in the room is that 71% versus 29% demonstrates that actually people are getting the training, they're getting into jobs, and if that were the result of the election, it would demonstrate on the morning after that actually the future I'm jobs sorry, are failing. Feet, no, is I'm not sorry, a failure. I'm well, sorry, Mr. Feeton, but there's a question that's coming from Marion, and we must take some of these. Will you, as Chief Minister, assure people already in work, asks Marion, uh, that they are as entitled to apply for jobs being advertised at the ETB as somebody who is unemployed? Can you assure people already in work that they are entitled to have equal consideration for every vacancy at the ETB? ETB and not have to wait for the unemployed to be considered first. Absolutely, and that's why I told you that I think some of the concerns that people have is that they are in employment and they want to change their employment. And we're the party that wants to support people who want to improve themselves. Now, the ETB 
is a service that's principally provided to the unemployed. It's the unemployed who go to the ETB. People who are in employment and want to improve themselves tend to be sitting at the desk doing a job or doing whatever it is that they do, see an advert, pick up the phone, apply and move from job to job. But the ETB is also able to share those vacancies with people who are in employment. Improving yourself, as I told you when we were under analyzing this particular area of the poll, I think is as important to some people as getting into a job is to others. Well, but, very briefly, Mr. Feetum. Well, uh, he's absolutely right. Improvement is important. People have got to be able to improve their lot in life and improve the, the, the lifestyle of their families. But the future job strategy, that's the criticism. It doesn't do that because the future job strategy does not prepare young people for the wider world. It's got it nothing offers to do with absolutely, the question. It offers absolutely, it is, because it's about, you have, ta you have talked about opportunities. You've spoken before about this particular point, and I need to respond to you. It does not create the kind of skills that you need for people to be properly prepared. And anybody who is on this scheme would be able to tell you exactly that. I have got people that have come to my offices telling me that their children are at home earning the minimum wage and not even being trained. They're just sitting there at home. Well, that cannot be right. And I'd that like cannot to know be who they are. About, and that cannot be about improvement. Now, in relation to, the, to this question, she's absolutely right. There are concerns that effectively what is happening here, because the government is so obsessed by, the, uh, by, by statistics, that people that are already in jobs that want to improve themselves are being told by the ETB, no, you can't apply for this particular job because it's got to go to the unemployed because you've, got, you've, you've already got a job. That is wrong. In fact, that is grotesquely wrong. It's not because what's no, happening. I, that is, and that is what's happening. But if I may also provide my own positive uh, um, uh, view of what we would do in relation to this question of training. What is required is proper training schemes. And what we would do is we would sit down with employers. We would actually fund proper training schemes where where uh, uh, targeted at areas within the economy that we foresee that there is going to be a growth in the future. We're doing that already. And no, you're not. Yes, we are. No, you're not. All you're doing well, is you basically you're analyzing. No, you're analyzing the statistics where there are Spaniards, where there are foreigners, and and effectively what you're trying to do is to replace those people with Gibraltarians. That is not That's the case. well and good, but you're not that really not looking at proper okay. training. Let's, you're not doing that. Let's, Fabian. let's allow the, the chief minister to respond to that. Well, you see, it, it's all very well for to say our policy would be to sit down with employers and to think of ways to do this, that or the other. We are already doing that. We are the incumbent. We're analysing where the economy is going and where the skills gaps are and we're training people for those skills gaps. Whether that is in care, whether that's in bookkeeping, whether that's in hostelery, whether that's in uh, the services industry, we're doing that already. But I'm surprised that the leader of the opposition doesn't seem to know that. Well, I well the, the reason why you're not doing that is because I have had we are doing it. No, you're not because I have an exchange with Joe Bosano precisely on this particular point. He has conducted a survey of employment, which is just simply a survey of who is employed where. In other words, what's the nationality? What are they doing? Why is that? Because what he wants to do is replace foreigners with Gibraltarians. That's all well and good, but you've got to go further than that. I have been advocating, and I have been urging him to adopt an approach <clears throat> where he conducts a survey of what are the skills that employers need in the future. What are the Sorry. markets that employers are going to be branching out in, into in the future? And what are the skills that they need from their employers? And okay. then what we ought to do is basically fund so, specific training so, schemes in those areas. That's not, Fabian, with respect, what you are well, doing. It is, now, I hope so why didn't that you do it, it is, in the 16 years when I you hope power. that that is what you will do now that you've effectively sacked Joe Bosano from his employment. Have been sacked. Joe Bassano, and you shouldn't get away with an aside like that, which disrespects somebody who's given 42 years of their lives to the politics of our community and has done nothing but improve and it. You can't but that quick, demonstrates and your style. You can't get rid of him quickly enough, Fabian. Look, uh, look, we so, all know that. So you don't know what your argument is. Is your argument that I am controlled by Joe Bassano or that I'm getting rid of Joe Bassano? You've got to make up well, your I'll mind. Well, I'll tell you what my argument is. At some is. stage, I'll tell you you've got to make up your mind. I'll tell you something my else. argument is Let that you should have been brave else. enough Let me tell you to have actually tackled him earlier and not six months before I'm to None of these big first. ideas that you're talking about us now, why didn't you implement any of them when you were a government minister for four years? Why didn't Peter Carvana implement them when he was chief minister? But we had. Okay, that's trade. a simple well, question. But we, we had. We the found construction more trading. unemployment than but there is today. Okay, no, gents, because we we're going to hand over to Nicole, who's waiting people. on the yeah. phone line. So well, so well, there haven't been any new intakes to the construction trading sector in three years. Please, we've got plenty of time yet, but Nicole's waiting on the line with a question about training. Thank you for your patience. Your question or viewpoint, please. 
Hi, good evening to both parties. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I've got a question. As a single parent out there, what are you going to be doing to help single parents get back into work? And again, I do agree with Mr. Feetum that the numbers don't seem to be quite right in unemployment because I do believe that it's a higher amount. And where we need to start is education. Educate your people to get employment. There are many of us who are educated who do have qualifications, yet we cannot get our footing in through that door because there are so many blockages. So what can you do to help us? Single parents out there want to go back to work and cannot because they cannot afford the childcare. Thank you ever so much for your call, work. Nicole. Thanks for your Thank you. viewpoint. Mr. Picardo. Well, I think, Nicole, if you have an issue like the one that you're describing, then the numbers will look huge to you because if you are suffering unemployment, it is an issue which I accept is huge in your life. But look, believe me, the numbers are down to 269 on Tuesday. It's a number that fluctuates every day. On Tuesday, it was 269. But as I've said, for every individual that is suffering unemployment, the issue will not go away and it's huge. Now, if you want to come back into the world of work, we need to assess what your skills are. If you come to the ETB and you are unemployed, you will be given an opportunity to have an interview within 24 hours to assess what your skills are and to ensure that we match you to the training opportunities that there are as soon as possible to get you back in employment. That's a commitment that applies to everyone who turns up at the ETB and who is unemployed. They get an interview within 24 hours for people within the service to help them assess what skills they have, to help them produce a CV, to come back into the world of work. Okay, thank you, Mr. Picardo. The caller was agreeing with your point, so I will therefore move on to the yes. next topic, Mr. Yes. Feetum, if I may, because we've got a lot but to get through. Do you want to have Fine. a very quick response? A very quick no, no, response. Uh, Go look, on. I think that I think that she's right. I think that more needs to be done in order to make sure that, that single mothers are able to go to work and we ought to consider things like uh, subsidising childcare so that mothers can uh, are, are able to then go back to work. So that might feature in your, ne in yes, your next manifesto? Yes, because at the end of the day, mothers that are in work, they then, uh, they then earn, they then pay taxes and it becomes self-funding to a certain extent. And again, it's, it's all part of trying to improve the lot of people. Everybody okay. across the board. Can I deal with that? Um, what I, we do I is that we... I believe you have I already, think, Mr. No, Pigano, Danny we may, have to Danny may on. agree with this. Somebody what has to have is, the final say. Sometimes we, it'll be you, sometimes it'll be... What I'll have to put we, my foot we, down, I'm afraid, Mr. We pay Mr. for the training. Okay. So for the period of training, people are paid. Okay. We, if we return to the issues our poll threw up as being most important, uh, we see that commerce and frontier fluidity, we've been discussing, of course, employment, but... Uh, commerce and frontier fluidity was a big concern for 12.5% and relations with Spain and incursions attracted 8%. So we're looking at a graph here which features uh, the respective weighting that the 650 respondents that we asked uh, face to face, uh, you know, what the importance was for them. Uh, we can see, Mr. Picardo, uh, that uh, if we take those issues uh, sequentially, uh, firstly, Gibraltar's economy was hit hard by problems at the frontier in 2013. How much better has 2014 been, if at all? Well, I think it's been considerably better, and I think the reason it's been considerably better is because Spain has changed its attitude to Gibraltar. And I think there's been a clear and objective reason why that has happened, and that is that Spain wanted to achieve a seat in the Security Council of the United Nations, a temporary seat, and therefore was doing everything possible to avoid international opprobrium of the sort that she had garnered for herself in 2013. So the UK was putting pressure on it behind no, the scenes? No, no, I think in part it was Spain putting pressure on herself to try and avoid having international flashpoints, which embarrass her like the like the world saw she should be embarrassed in 2013 given the way that she'd acted in respect to Gibraltar. We are unfortunate that we have a Partido Popular government in Spain. The GSD had to face a Partido Popular government in Spain between 1996 and 2003. And many of the issues that we see today were then played out in the way that Gibraltar suffered between uh, those years when Mr. Aznar was in government, and in particular in the way that that built up towards the joint sovereignty denouement. Okay, let's ask you a similar question, Mr. Feetum. Uh, as leader of the opposition, how <coughs> well do you think Gibraltar has fared uh, in respect of cross-frontier trade over the past 12 months? Well, I think that Main Street has suffered considerably as a consequence of the uh, of the queues. There is no doubt about that. I mean, you go to Main Street and you talk to traders down Main Street, and they are the principal sufferers of the the policy 
of punishment, as I've described it in Spain on many, many occasions, of the Pepe government. That, that, that's absolutely right. Indeed, uh, businesses across the frontier have equally suffered because we know that, uh, that businesses across the frontier, some of them, have suffered about 40 to 50% drop in trade. Our economy has also suffered. Let's not forget about this. Dr. Joseph Garcia gave an interview uh, about three months ago on public television where he said that the revenue from uh, tourism and the tourism, tourism sector had actually gone down by 37 million, representing a drop in revenue in the tourist sector of 30%. That is considerable. That is why we'll come back to debate it. That's why I always urge caution on the government in relation to public finances because you can't her hermetically seal public finances from questions such as to Spain. Undoubtedly, the situation is better now. We've had some flashpoints. When we were in Ronda, for example, the queues were about five hours. Well, you made a statement the queues were five hours. I'm told, actually, that the queues may have been around about two and a half to three hours. That is completely unacceptable, and that continues. But it's certainly better than it was last year. OK, um, we, if we return to our polls, we know that, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, from the 650 people that we asked, ad hoc talks uh, with the UK and Spain are positive. A vast majority, 67% said yes, 20% said they don't know, and just 13% said no. So um, I suppose in that respect, we can analyze what might have happened or, or you know, how badly Main Street is doing or how well the economy is performing. Uh, but the solution to the frontier issue is dialogue. You both agree that. And it seems that uh, you've got a nod from the vast majority of Gibraltarian voters. Yes, and something which, frankly, I'm, I'm very pleased about because you know, the tripartite is, we all agree, the right way that Gibraltar needs to be involved in dialogue going forward. But we know that we're dealing with a Partido Popular government in Spain. And in the same way as you know, the Gibraltar government has fought an election and becomes the government based on the mandate in the manifesto, the Partido Popular became the government of Spain with an election mandate in its manifesto saying it would not attend the trilateral. So one of the things that uh, William Haig, uh, Joseph Garcia and I had to do was to sit down and devise a way where we could give life to the concept of dialogue without requiring the Partido Popular to go against its manifesto commitment on the trilateral issue. And there we worked very closely with colleagues in the Foreign Office and came up with the ad hoc formula. It hasn't been possible to actually agree a meeting of the ad hoc uh, formula proposal. But look, we keep trying and we are closer every day to achieving that possibility. OK, well, we had a whole hour last week with respect, Mr. Feetum. So rather than ask you about that, I'll give you a question from Stephen, who asks, um, what do you think of Podemos, the, if you've uh, contemplated or started any dialogue with them? Uh, he says they're favourites on the latest Spanish polls and uh, therefore their views on Gibraltar should be important to know. I think he's absolutely right. I think that they are, that it's absolutely critical. We've certainly taken steps, and I hope the government has also taken steps, and I'm quite prepared to sit down with Fabian and to talk about my thinking in relation to this. I've asked for a meeting with, uh, with the leader of, uh, of Podemos. I'm in the process, actually, of organising a conference in San Roque, a joint conference between my party and Podemos in San Roque, where we're going to be talking about the issues affecting the, the region. But Podemos are potentially the power brokers in any future Spanish government, because even if they don't win the election outright, and it's highly unlikely that they will, they could find themselves in a situation where they hold the balance of power. If we can influence... Podemos, in relation to Gibraltar, and, uh, you know, these are, these are people that I think have probably got a, a more of an open mind. They have, they're not uh, hamstrung by traditional mm -hmm. Spanish positions in relation to many issues, uh, and, and perhaps it's not the, the, it's any, any different in relation to Gibraltar. If we can influence, at an early juncture, their policy towards Gibraltar, it's a massive coup for, uh, for this community. OK, um, so do we agree for once tonight? We agree entirely. I think Podemos is inspiring in many ways. It's, it's worrying in some other ways. I don't think it because will Because what it says election. of the current parties? Or? No, no, because of, of some of the things it says about what it would do. For example, one of the Podemos policies, which I think they're now resiling from, is the idea that they wouldn't pay the international debt. Mm. Um, and I think that would be very dangerous for any community, in particular for Spain, mm. given the recession she's been through. Uh, but also inspiring in many ways in the way that they freshen up politics. And we are in contact with them. We are trying to influence their thinking on Gibraltar. I think we have. I think they do not have the old prejudices. And you said my theory is, of Spanish politics generally, mm -hmm. that a, a Spanish political leader 
I, I used to say, will one day. I actually think as a result of my contacts with some of them at the highest levels, has actually already woken up one morning and thought, what fools we make of ourselves on Gibraltar. Let us deal with these people respectfully and let us understand in a modern way how Gibraltar and Spain need to be continuing to, to get on. Okay, and we're doing a lot of work with Podemos and with the PSOE in respect of that potential better future for the relations between Gibraltar and Spain. We've and got you a can't call. ignore the Pepe as well. You've got to... You've oh, got absolutely to, not. You, you've got Gents, to, the the Pepe may, do try to ignore we've us. We've got a call no. from the distinguished former Mayor Momi Levy. Good evening, Mr Levy. Your question of viewpoint. Very important. But will it not be ideal, with the greatest of respect, if both you gentlemen concentrated on making the British government take action rather than words against the Spanish government with regards to queues and illegal incursions, etc.? No. Thank you ever so much for your call, Mr. Levy. Would you like to respond to that first, Mr. Feetham? Well, look, I mean, I agree that there is a range of issues in which the, 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 the UK government could take action, particularly legal action. I mean, one of the areas, for example, is this question of the potential exclusion of Gibraltar from, uh, from single skies. In the early 1990s, when uh, Gibraltar, when we were excluded from similar measures, Gibraltar took <coughs> legal action in the European Court of Justice. Uh, the advisory opinion from the Advocate General was actually very positive towards Gibraltar. <clears throat> he thought that we should have won that case. We lost because Gibraltar had no locus standa. You may recall Gibraltar had no locus standa. Now, the UK did not participate there. Now, I would hope that if we are going to be, if the shenanigans from Spain continue in relation to that area, that's one area where the UK government could take legal action. I mean, there are other areas where the UK government could take legal action. I think that it is something in the armory that the okay. UK government could and should consider. A possibility? Indeed a possibility. Uh, there are many areas where the UK could in part take legal action and take other action which is political and could be very effective. And part of the work of the Chief Minister of Gibraltar is to continue to keep the British government's toes to the fire to try and ensure that they take action when it is necessary and when it is appropriate. There are other avenues to be pursued uh, as an alternative but it's not often uh, possible to ensure that we get to, I mean Danny's a litigator and I've been a litigator, to the stage which we understand best which is going to court. And of course litigation can also bring an element of uncertainty. Uh, there's one point on which Danny is wrong. The United Kingdom did intervene in the airport case. Derek Wyatt, who used to lecture me at Oxford, came in very day, one day very excited into a lecture and explained what the UK had done in respect of that it's case. Very limited. It was a very it limited, was a limited role, intervention, very limited actually designed to perfect. go against Gibraltar. Designed to go against Gibraltar. One of the reasons I've never forgiven him, although he was an excellent professor of European law. Okay, so we've got plenty to get through. We've got a lot of questions coming in on housing. Um, some, unfortunately, have come through on unemployment, uh, and, but unfortunately we've moved on from that subject, and I think that if we keep going back and forth, we just won't have any structure tonight. Uh, but please do keep your emails coming if they're on topic, viewpoint at gbc.gi. We will be discussing commercial fishing and the location of the new stadium after this short break. <laughs> 